efforts that are in terms of uh, uh, the democratic process. Uh, uh, so today, what's going to happen uh, is that uh, Robert Rock is uh, in Washington from uh, 1988. Uh, the English major, uh, Bob Peter, uh, went on to do work in a variety of governmental and, and business uh, operations. And over the last uh, handful of years, has developed a, uh, a whole array of Second Hendricks alum to represent uh, uh, the second district, and I think he's the second Republican to uh, represent the second congressional district. Uh, in second Republican elected Tommy switch party, so technically third, but yeah, second elected. That's right. Very good. Very good. So what's going to happen here is Roby is really going to uh, interview Tim for about thirty minutes, uh, and then uh, in the second half of uh, of the hour, we'll open up to Q and A. And this is to be casual. Whatever's on your mind uh, about life as congressman, why are the issues that are on your mind? I'll just turn it over to you. All okay. right, thanks, Jay, and thanks for having all of us here. And congressman, thanks for being with us today. Thank you. Tommy Robinson is a Hendrix. No, no, no. Oh, did you say Hendrix? No, no, no. No, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, all right, all right. Can I mention Man, something I before we say. start? Yes, please. We were all here at the same time. Uh, I will. I'll never forget. Now, you were president of the class. 86, 87? Okay, so I was a freshman. I'll never forget going into the auditorium and getting that sort of first week speech from you. And, and Roby, you were a couple of years ahead of me. I was the next year. Next year, and I lived my second year, 87, 88. I lived on the third floor, nor, uh, third floor east end east side of Martin Hall, and you you were the... I was on the second floor. Oh, you were you? Okay. Yep. Yep. Well, at one point, you lived next door to me, in any event. Maybe that was, it was that year, but, <laughs> but we were in Martin at the same time, and uh, we were all on campus at the same time. Yeah, and as Jay never points out, but I always do, he beat me for Senate president when we ran against each other. I'm so not going to tell who I, I voted I came back for. the next year, so, yeah. We know how you voted. We got all that stuff tracked, so. All right, uh, well, we're gonna talk just a little casually about uh, Tim's journey uh, before Hendrix, through Hendrix, after Hendrix to get him to where he is, and uh, we'll stay, we'll wait till a little bit deeper into this discussion to talk more about some of the policy issues of the day, so we'll go a little personal here first to, to get started. You, you are, say you're from Magnolia and you're a preacher's kid, which we're going to talk about, but you actually were not born That's right. in Magnolia. I, I was born in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, my dad's side of the family uh, was from North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, and my mother's side of the family, going back to the late 1800s, was from South Arkansas. Uh, her family beyond that was from Georgia, and but... They came, her, her family came to South Arkansas in the 1800s, and that was the same, uh, those are the same ancestors of Sid McMath, who's a Democrat governor uh, from 48 to 52. Uh, my great, great grandfather is, was fought in the Civil War and is buried in Columbia County, and that was Sid's great grandfather. Okay. So my mother's side was in Arkansas, and my parents met at Washita, and when I was about 11, uh, we'd been living in North Carolina. Uh, my family, my dad took a church in Magnolia. So I moved to Magnolia in six, February of sixth grade. Okay. Was your dad one of these preachers that reminds me of John Lithgow in the, um, 
in the movie Footloose where he's up there delivering fire and brimstone? No. Was he a lot, little different than that? My, my dad, uh, still, he's still living. Uh, my dad grew up in that culture as a Southern Baptist. I, my grandfather was a Southern Baptist minister, my great-grandfather, my great-uncle. And my dad really rebelled against a lot of the, what theologically we call legalism and the rules. and the, So my dad um, was not like that at all. Uh, my dad certainly had conservative theological beliefs and still does. Um, but my dad was more of a, uh, he, he would tell you that he teach grace, not legalism. And he was very open. He was not rules oriented. He was very, I, I like to think he was very intellectual. He was very much a thinking man's pastor. He, if you said, if you called him preacher, he'd say, I'm a janitor. I'm just here to serve. And if you said, well, you were preaching, he'd say, I don't preach, I just teach. So he was, he was very unorthodox in that regard. And um, so he was, he was not your typical uh, minister of that, Southern Baptist minister of that era, and still today. It, what, what, how are you like your father in terms of uh, the personality, characteristics? Um, loved to read. Uh, I probably, one of my hobbies is collecting books and I uh, love to travel just like my dad. You know, I think, um, I think as I watch my father in the church, because church politics is as bad as, <laughs> as, as, uh, oh. as, as regular old politics. Uh, I, I joke that the Lord wanted me to stay away from politics, so he, he, he kept me from being a pastor. Um, but, you know, I watched my father, and I always thought that at times he was a little too unorthodox. I, in retrospect, I don't have those feelings like I used to. But at the time, I thought that he was a little too unorthodox. Um, but in retrospect, I see a lot of what uh, he was doing. And uh, he was... He was trying to break through a lot of the tradition that weren't that he didn't believe was grounded in, in, in faith. And I and and so uh, he wasn't crazy out there, but he would push the envelope just enough to make some people uncomfortable. And I think there's I think there's some of that in me. Uh, you know, I'm pretty traditional in in a lot of ways, but people who get to know me, I think, find it hard to pigeonhole me. And my dad was very hard to pigeonhole. You know, you think, well, he's a Southern Baptist minister. He's going to act this way. Maybe you think he would act like Lithgow in uh, Footloose or whatever. Um, and I think the more you get to know my dad, the more you see he's, he doesn't fit into any of those categories. And I think there was a part of me, there is a part of me uh, that sometimes does that um, and uh, when it's needed. I'll tell you uh, 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 an example of one of the things my dad did, and he never really talked about it much growing up until I got a little older, and it, I don't think it was that, uh, it wasn't a huge event in his life in terms of, um, uh, uh, in terms of scaring him or, or uh, changing uh, the way he behaved, but it was a significant event nonetheless. And, and that is in the, late, in the late 60s, early 70s in North Carolina, he was the, before he broke off into a non-denominational church, he was the traditional pastor, so to speak, of a traditional Southern Baptist church. And that was during the movement when there was a lot of hippies and, and a lot of protest and a lot of social unrest. And my dad was one who welcomed everybody. And he would, he would say, look, he would say to a lot of deacons, and it made them mad, he would say, look, Jesus could come in here and you wouldn't let him, you wouldn't let him attend because you didn't like the way he dressed, or you didn't like the way he acted, or you didn't like this or that. And so my dad was always sort of stirring people up on legitimate, I think, legitimate issues. One day, um, or one, at one point, he was allowing, um, it was a working class neighborhood where this church was in Charlotte, still there today, the church is, 
uh, there were a lot of African Americans in the, in the neighborhood, and they had nowhere to play. They didn't have a gym or, you know, a boys club or whatever. So uh, my dad said, well, I'm going to let them use the gym here at Wilmot Baptist. Well, that wouldn't be a big deal today. That was a huge deal in 1970, 69, whatever, in Charlotte, North Carolina. So he allowed the uh, African-American kids in the neighborhoods to use the gym. And uh, one day he was standing, and I didn't learn this till many years later. One day he was standing outside, and what he described as a uh, sort of a, I guess, a overweight white guy in a big, long Cadillac, okay, uh, pulled up, rolled his window down. My dad was outside. He said, hey, preacher, you know, come here or something like that. And he came over and handed my dad this rolled up piece of paper. And uh, I, I couldn't remember if he made a comment and drove off or he just handed him that. But in any event, it was a paper towel. It's like a bounty paper towel. And my dad unrolled it and it said, the Ku Klux Klan is watching you, white N-word preacher. Um, my dad didn't change anything he was doing. He just kept doing it. Uh, he kept that thing rolled up in a file cabinet for years. And probably when I was, I don't know, 11, 12, uh, I think when I'd moved to uh, Arkansas, uh, he showed it to me. And, and then when, when I got a little older, I was like, man, I got, that's sort of a piece of history. So I, ha so I got it about 10 years ago and had it framed in museum quality, you know, deal, and I, I keep it in the closet as sort of a historic piece of paper to remind me. But, but that was the type of thing my dad was, was doing, and it's, you know, uh, so he was willing to push the envelope. And, and I, I think that that little stories like that, anecdotes like that, um, uh, really made an impact on me. Um, and uh, so what about your mom your mom's a school teacher mom is a preschool teacher still teaching um so she's easy she easily deals with you now right yes, so, yes yeah you're yeah. in congress so. yes she uh she she's always sort of uh kept me in my place but um you know i i think both of my parents i can say strong christians very very grounded very servant oriented. Um, if I could do a tenth of what either of my parents have done in terms of service to people, um, you know, that would be that would be just amazing and something to be proud of. Both of my parents hard, hard workers. I mean, just have worked every day of their lives. My mom is seventy, going on seventy one, I, I guess. No, I guess she is. I guess she is 71. Um, and, uh, yeah, 71, going on 72. And she works every day. And my dad still works every day. Uh, and he's 75 or 6. Uh, so, you know, just really grounded, hardworking, and I knew nothing but love. Uh, unconditional love. My, my, parents, uh, my parents encouraged me. But they never, uh, they never demanded really anything of me. Um, and, you know, uh, this is a method of school. I picked this school. This was my number one choice. My dad never said, I can't believe, you're, you know, you're not going to Washita or whatever. Uh, you know, whatever I wanted to do, they were, they were, they were very deferential. Uh, they felt like we've raised him the way we thought he ought to be raised, and now he's going to make decisions. And um, they were very supportive and encouraging with regard to Hendricks, very proud of Hendricks. In later years, I developed a relationship with Miss M.E. Peace. Some of you have heard the name. Uh, her silver set, uh, I think, used to be in the administration building. Uh, she did a lot of things here at Hendrix. If you, if you don't know about her, uh, the, she's had a major impact on Hendrix. She's gone now, passed away. But, but uh, when she found out uh, that I was at Hendrix in the <coughs> 80s, uh, she reached out, developed a close relationship 
with my family, was very supportive. And, and uh, you know, we just, uh, they, my parents and, and uh, the community just embraced me and were very encouraging and supportive. And, and um, I look back on all that fondly. Okay, let's talk about when you got the, when the political bug bit you, you were, was it in high school? Well, you know what's interesting is when I was... It was local politics. Yeah, well, when I was growing up, I, I remember in the 70s, and I, I don't know remember all the details, but I remember Governor Hunt of North Carolina, a Democrat. Um, he was governor, and I, I, for some reason, I have just some faint memories of being interested in politics and him being governor and what that meant and all that. But in terms of really... It, I watched stuff that was political on television, but in terms of really getting involved, um, and I had heard that my cousin had been governor, but I really, you know, it was a far away cousin. I didn't know him really, and it just didn't really have an impact on me. Um, <clears throat> but in 1982 or three, a guy showed up at church in Magnolia and he was a politician. He was a state senator from Camden, Bill Friendly Henley, Democrat. Susan McDougal, some of you may remember Susan McDougal from the whole Whitewater deal, her brother. And he showed up with his family to, um, to church, my dad's church. And, you know, a lot of different, I could speculate why they picked our church, but in any event, my dad was a great pastor, that's a good reason. <laughs> um, so they showed up and introduced themselves, and, and I, I got to know them. So he said, hey, you want a page for me in the state senate in Little Rock? And I was like, yeah, I'd love to. Come on up. Page in 83, uh, you know, you sit outside the senate, and you just basically sit there and run errands. You know, that's, you learn a little bit about the process. I loved it in 85. I got my picture with Bill Clinton in 83, which I still have. Uh, and uh, in 85, did it again. Went. Uh, my family was starting to develop a friendship with Bill Friendly, Henley's family. And so here's what happened. 85 came around, and Bill Henley's getting ready to run for Senate in 86. Re-election. Well, who's he running against? He's going to run against a guy from my hometown. Mike Connard, who's a friend of mine today. But that was a little tricky because in, our, in that state senate district, you had the population centers of Camden, where Henley was from, and Magnolia, where I was from, and, I, and my family, we were siding with the other guy, with the Camden guy. But I, you know, I had page for him and got my second picture with Clinton, and, and I started working on his campaign. Um, was in a TV commercial forum. I didn't really know Susan McDougal, but there was John Henley and Jim Henley and all these folks I learned a lot about later during the Whitewater, you know, years. Um, but uh, so I, I, was, I was all in for Bill Henley. And my family was all in. You know, we, we were all in. We, you know, we got to know him. And that was a, he lost in 86. That was a really tough loss. Um, and Mike Conard won. Mike Conard went on to be a, a court of appeal ju appeals judge appointed by BB, went on to be an advisor to BB, state senator for a long time. And Bill Henley just disappeared, just completely disappeared from the scene. Um, didn't talk to him uh, for years. And so I, I went on, uh, I came to Hendricks, wasn't real involved in politics. You know, I joined, uh, I joined the clubs here. Um, yeah, you joined the, I joined the, the Republican and Democratic well, clubs. Well, you know, what happened is I joined the College Democrats. In fact, I think it was right here in this room. I joined the College Democrats, and I walked in that door. In fact, it was this room. I walked in that door to one of the first meetings, and it was during the era where they were debating, I think, Bork. And I just quickly realized that a Democrat is not a Democrat is not a Democrat. There were Hendricks Democrats, and then there were Magnolia, Arkansas Democrats. And they weren't exactly the same. And I was like, That's, these aren't like the Democrats that I grew up with. 
And so I moved, I switched to... You get to explain that comment a little yeah. bit. Yeah, well, it, it, the Democrats I grew up with were conservative on most everything. And today, many of them have become Republicans. But uh, most of the Democrats in Magnolia are pro-life, for example. Most of the Democrats would vote for anybody but President Obama in Magnolia, well, in the state, for that matter. But, um, uh, but, it, but in, but, you know, so there was a contrast between, there were Republicans, then there were Democrats in central Arkansas, maybe Hendricks, maybe the more liberal, and then there were the South Arkansas rural Democrats, and they were different. And I said, you know, I think I'm more at home with the college Republicans. So I joined the college Republicans shortly thereafter, but I didn't make a big deal of it because I really wasn't, I, I watched Crossfire, I was interested, but I really wasn't volunteering for anybody. I just, I was studying, I was being a college kid, you know? You know, most college kids join political clubs because either if you're a guy, the girls are cute, yeah. and if you're a girl, the guys are yeah. cute, but this is clearly not. Yeah, I had a girlfriend back home, you, so, so I wasn't, oh, yeah. Right, okay. and, and, uh, and, but, but yeah, I just wasn't really into politics in college, except for, I was into policy, I love Crossfire. I'll never forget it. I used to sit in Martin Hall watching Crossfire with uh, Roger Dorsey, who's a lawyer accountant in North Little Rock. Anyway, um, so didn't do much during, uh, politically during uh, college. Went to law school. Really didn't do at Tulane. Uh, well, I actually went overseas, didn't do anything politically there. Came back, uh, went to Tulane in, law, in New Orleans. Didn't really do anything politically there in the technical sense of political, Democrat, Republican, didn't really do anything. Um, but uh, was real involved with uh, conservative lawyers throughout that time, but, uh, but it wasn't really political. So got out of law school, and then I just started to get engaged politically. I you know, started volunteering for groups um, and, moved, and, and got an opportunity to go to D.C., uh, volunteered for Dole in 96 uh, and started dabbling um, and that's when it really th that's when I really got focused and I realized that yeah I'd gone to law school but I was more interested in a lot of political stuff than being a traditional bill 2,000 hours a year lawyer that would be okay if I didn't have politics but politics was going to be my first, um, was going to be my, my, my first love. And I wasn't sure that I would get into elected politics. You know, I thought that might happen. I just knew I liked politics. Uh, and so that's what sort of started the path. Uh, moved to D.C. from New Orleans after, you know, law school and all. Moved to D.C. in 95, and that started... Um, this sort of tug of war within me. Go back home to Arkansas, stay in D.C. and take advantage of opportunities. And on about two or three or two or three occasions, I move back. Then I'd get an opportunity and go back to D.C. Move back to Arkansas, get an opportunity, go back to D.C. And uh, so I sort of I was able to do all that because I was not married. Didn't have any responsibilities other than me. I didn't have kids. Didn't have a wife. Um, a wife wouldn't have put up with all that. Uh, as I, I know, my current wife would have said, "Wait, what are you doing?" Uh, so, uh, so that was sort of a period where I was figuring out uh, what it is that I wanted to do. But the good, but the good thing is, because my education was so broad, I was able to. I was able to have options. I had the law option. You know, I had taken the Arkansas bar. I had taken Louisiana bar. I, I could do that. But also had the political option. So it, um, and then I joined the Army Reserve in 96 and uh, really got into the JAG thing. And, and that sort of opened another facet or, or, or um, it gave me another set of options. Um, and so, you know, I, I found that that's why when I talk to young kids, I say, 
do whatever gives you as many options as possible because you never really know what it is you're going to you want to do down the road. And if you close options off early, you may regret it later. And, and you know, so um, that's a long answer, uh, but it, but it was a very evolving uh, situation with regard to my interest in politics. It wasn't like I said, this is what I want to do and I'm going to do that. Uh, it was it was very much evolving. I did not, as you can ask Jay, and you know, I didn't take a traditional path um, to get here. Let's jump forward to um, you deciding to run for Congress when you uh, decided to get into the race back in 2009. Nine, September 21st. Uh, I'm glad you can remember the exact date there. Uh, Vic Snyder was still the congressman and planning mm -hmm. on running for re-election. Why do you think you had a snowball's chance running against a long-time incumbent who was still pretty popular in the district? Um, well, I, I was convinced. I was convinced that, based on all my work in politics, I was convinced that if we, meaning the Republicans could put up a candidate who um, could get enough support to raise money so that they could communicate their message on television in a significant way, that that would, could potentially be a game changer. And why do I say that? Because when you're talking about, you can't go door to door in seven, when there's 700,000 people in a congressional district, you just can't do it. At a 700, at, at a congressional district level, you are very reliant upon television and radio. And as someone who's in television, you know that television is very expensive, very expensive. And if you look at, and I won't go into all the details, but if you look at the people who had challenged Vic before, uh, many of them um, many of them had raised some money, but maybe not enough to really communicate on the level I thought needed to be communicated. I looked at the district, and I saw a district that voted for Bush twice. It voted for McCain by 11. And... Um, if you go back and look at the 96 race, uh, Bud Cummins barely lost. 52-48. Yeah, and he lost, barely lost, when Clinton was on the ballot. I looked at all that stuff, and I said, this is a conservative district. This is a conservative district. We do not have a conservative member of Congress, but this is a conservative district. Right of center district. Um, and I was... I was convinced of it, and I, but I thought that in order to, to do all the things necessary to win, you needed to be well financed. So I, but I thought I could do that. Uh, I thought I could do that. Um, you know, I thought I could work harder. Um, and I concluded after a lot of talks with my wife and, and, and prayer and a lot of discussion, I concluded that ultimately I would be okay if I ran a quality race and lost. Now, I may have been kidding myself, <laughs> but, but I concluded after a lot of talk that, 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 you know, if I run a good race and we don't win for whatever reason, at least I tried. Yeah. That, I really got to that point. And, um, and my wife, who had never wanted me to be involved in elect electoral politics, said, um, you know, I think I'm okay with it. I don't want you to not do it because of me. Because I wasn't going to run if my wife opposed it. We were going to do it as a team or not at all. And that's the way you really need to do these things. And um, so I didn't run any polls. Uh, I didn't, but what I knew was, I knew, I, I knew that in a congressional race, 
to really, really impact folks in terms of communication, get your message out, you needed to, you needed to raise some serious money, like a million or so. Right. And I knew he wouldn't raise money, and the Vic wouldn't raise money till 90 days from the election. Right. So I knew that every day that I was raising money uh, and working and you know engaging with the grassroots and all that was the day that he wasn't. And so I thought if I can raise a half a million dollars or so and, um, and really be aggressive um, by February or so when, when he starts, that would not be an insignificant advantage. And what happened is I just went I mean, I was working all day, every day, and all I did was call, 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 visit, 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 visit. Just, that's all I did. I was on the phone all day, and I was meeting at night, pretty much. Meeting everybody I could. And I saw what was going on nationally with the health care bill and some other stuff. I, I was not a, oblivious to that, obviously. And then January came around, and a third-party group, my understanding, a third party group that favored Vic were scared that Vic was not doing more in terms of raising, because of his raising money rule. And, and this is, some of this is just opining, but, uh, but so the, the, what I was told is they ran this poll to sort of show people how, what, the, what the lay of the land was. That's, that's I don't know, it wasn't my poll. But in any event, they ran this poll and it showed me up 17 or something like that, which who knows if it was accurate or not. But that same day or the following morning, um, uh, Snyder announced his retirement. Uh, and then that obviously moved the campaign into a completely... Yeah, changed the dynamic. Yeah. So really we found a way to get you out of office for any potential opponent, and that is to talk your wife... Yes. Into uh, telling you you can't be a congressman. Yes, uh, that's right. Let's open it up to you guys. We can take uh, personal or policy questions. I've kind of kept this on a personal level here, so. Yes. Um, but let's have you guys ask some questions. I see Rob Smith in the back of the room, and Mr. Cox did too. Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Put my glasses on so I don't embarrass myself here. I can't. If see. not, I'm going to ask more questions. Ask Hendrix, crazy Hendrix questions about our times here. I love talking about that because I know a lot of stuff on Roby and Jay. Yes, sir. By voter restrictions, you mean uh, requiring an ID? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, sure. Uh, there are, obviously, every state that's passed one has a different one, so I'll just talk about them generally. Oh, thanks. Appreciate it. And those are, um, those are state, state specific. Look, I don't have a problem with, and I think it's, uh, a good idea to make sure that you check someone's ID when they're when they're voting. I don't have a problem with that. I think it's a good idea. We check my ID when I use a credit card. We check my ID when um, I well, they don't check my ID much when I buy wine anymore, but because I look over 21. But <laughs> we generally check IDs if you buy cigarettes. We check IDs for all of these things, um, and. We certainly, it certainly makes sense to me to check a government ID. Now, does there need to be an escape valve or some kind of contingency if somebody, for whatever reason, doesn't have it? Sure, where you flag it and you check into it or whatever the deal is. And, um, and in, um, in some states, they, what they do is they set those ballots aside to make sure that, to, to make sure that they confirm that those people are who they say they are. I would tell you that I would bet money, I'm not a betting man, but I would bet money 
that you know, probably 99% of voters have some sort of legitimate government ID. Probably more than one. And uh, do we need to make sure that we're not excluding that 1% or half of 1% who don't and make sure we look into, you know, have a mechanism for that? Sure, of course. But, you know, if Roby walks up and wants to vote, uh, I got no problem saying, uh, show me your ID. Show me you are who you say you are. I think that's just common sense. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we have some... Uh, we have some cases right now involving uh, voter shenanigans. I don't know exactly their status, but uh, I'm not uh, over in eastern Arkansas. We're going to see how all that shakes out. But uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, if you look, I watch MSNBC every morning because I like Morning Joe, and I hear them all the time talk about the law being. Uh, excluding people from voting, but uh, that's, I don't buy it, uh, you know, and, and of course, every state's different, I'd have to look at the specific one, I'm not saying I would agree with every single one, uh, but the general idea that people, of Eric Holder has even said, the general idea that, that they're trying to keep people from voting who can legally vote, I don't buy it, I, I'm certainly not trying to do that. Yes, sir. Uh, first, on the on the uh, on the first uh, stat, I have no idea whether it's one or eleven or nine or uh, I have no problem saying it's eleven or twelve or fifteen. My point is that most folks have an ID, and those who don't, we need to make sure that we have a way of, of dealing with that so that we don't exclude legitimate voters from voting. So I think we can agree on that. Uh, I don't know exactly which party leaders you're talking about. Uh, if you're and and if you're talking, if you're, which which programs are you categorizing as as welfare? Medicaid. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Sure. Well, uh, first of all, I'd say this. I speak for Tim Griffin, and that's the only person I can speak for. Uh, I can point to a number of people in either party that say things that I don't agree with, and I'm sure you can too. So uh, I'll speak for Tim Griffin. Um, uh, I am. Uh, I have voted for and back reforms to save Medicare. Uh, the President of the United States has not done, has not proposed one thing that puts Medicare on a sustainable path. Uh, and and you look puzzled. I, I, I'm just telling you, Medicare. If you believe in the status quo for Medicare meaning no changes, then you believe in its bankruptcy. Because in nine years, it's going bankrupt. And a lot of that, it's nothing to do with welfare or anything else. It has to do with demographics. Uh, we have a baby boomer generation that, and this is not a technical measurement, but the baby boomer generation is like this. And for years, they were working, paying in to a system supporting a much smaller uh, population. As the baby boomers have aged, they are moving from working and paying in to taking 10,000 new Medicare retirees a day, so, and people are living longer. 
So what is happening is that we have a system that is going bankrupt. Uh, we, and if you, if you defend, the, and I'm not saying you are, but if you say, leave it exactly as it is, do nothing, then you are ensuring its demise. <clears throat> and right now, the average couple pays $100,000 into Medicare and pulls $350,000 out. That is mathematically unsustainable. So folks who are doing nothing for Medicare, and, and you can apply this general argument. I use Medicare because it's a good argument. You can apply this general concept to others. If you do nothing, it goes away. Uh, look, at what, look at Democrat uh, Senator Wyden and, and Ryan who have a new Medicare uh, reform plan. And there are a bunch, you know, I welcome lots of reform plans. We can debate them. The only thing that we can't do is stick with the status quo because that is the only thing that is going bankrupt. Uh, or that is, that is a sure uh, path to bankruptcy. Same goes for Social Security, although Social Security, uh, and I am, for the record, I am for Medicare and Social Security. My, I pay into both of them out of my check every time I get paid. My mother receives Medicare and Social Security. Um, but Social Security is not quite in as bad a shape. It still, it has till I think 2037 uh, before it, it meets the fate of Medicare. Bill Clinton appointed a Medicare commission in 1998. He didn't appoint a Medicare commission in 98 because it was solvent. He appointed a Medicare commission in 1998 because it was going bankrupt. And uh, these years later, we've still got that problem. The truth is both, both parties have been completely unwilling historically, not in the last year, but they've been completely unwilling to tell the American people the truth about some of these programs. They either were silent or they just sort of said we can fix it later and kicked the can down the road. Well, uh, that is a recipe for disaster. And so a year ago I voted for reform. I'm going to vote for reform again. Uh, and, you know, what, what the other side has thought is, hey, the Republicans are going to, they're going to walk out on this plank with this reform, and then we're going to do nothing, and we'll watch them self-destruct because you can't grab the third rail and survive. Well, that's turned out to be a bunch of hogwash. Uh, I am running for re-election in the 2nd Congressional District. I was targeted by the other side about a year ago. It is one week away from the end of filing, and we're still waiting on an opponent. I'm sure I'll get one, uh, and we will uh, make our contrast with them known. But the point is, the point is, when we get out and explain to folks and communicate with folks that reforms, you don't have to agree on the reforms, whatever, but, but you, you, we can all agree that the status quo is a road to disaster. And when you get out and talk about that, People understand and people appreciate it. And uh, we, we fought that fight over the last year and we're going to keep fighting it. So I reject your premise that, uh, at least for me personally, I want to save a lot of these programs. Uh, but if we don't fix our broader uh, drivers of the debt, uh, we're going to end up like Europe. Yeah, we'll come back. Yeah, I'll give you my cell phone. You can call me. I'll, but we'll do a follow-up in just a second here. Yes. Sure. 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 Uh, party whip, whether you're in the state legislature in Little Rock or what, whether you're in the, um, in the Congress, mean that you are, you're assigned several people. Okay, several members of your party, and what you do is you develop relationships with them, and you uh, you find out where they stand. For example, it's a pretty simple deal. Let's say I'm the whip, and this is a room full of members of the Republican caucus. Now I can 
I could sort of guess what everybody feels like on a particular piece of legislation. Or, that's not smart. Uh, or I can ask all of them individually. In which case, I'd say, how do you feel about the budget this year? Yes, no, maybe, okay. How do you feel? How do you feel? Not real efficient. You're going to get an accurate answer probably. But you can't do it. There's too many, particularly when you've got... You know, 242, 243. So the whip, the whip, appoints assistant whips and assigns several people. So he'll say, hey, Tim, uh, I like you. I'd like for you to be on the team. You're going to get Roby, Dr. Barry, and Jay. Those are assigned to you, okay? And the number one function, not to convince them, the number one function is to find out how they feel, okay? So why would he assign me Roby? He might assign me Roby because he's from my home state. He might assign me Roby because I've known Roby a long time, whatever. And so what happens is the WIPS office will say, we're thinking about bringing this piece of legislation to the floor. And we want to know, we don't want to bring anything to the floor that we don't have votes for because it's a waste of everybody's time. So they'll say, uh, whips, go to the, go to the uh, table on the floor and get your whip card at the next vote. So I'll get my whip card and I'll go up to Roby and I'll say, Roby, how, are you, how do you feel about the transportation bill? He'll go, I don't know. You know, I haven't really thought much about it yet. I go, well, we might have a vote on that this week. Do you need more information? And he'll go, Ah, let me talk to my staff about it. Or he'll say, I'm a definite yes. I'm on the transportation committee. I voted for it out of committee. I'm a no, that's a no-brainer. I'm a definite yes. Or somebody else might go, you know, there's some things in it I like. some things in it I don't like. And so the goal is to give accurate information to the whip so that the whip can know we got X number definites. We got X number maybes. We better not bring this to the floor because we probably don't have uh, the votes to pass it or uh, we do have or whatever. And that is the main function. That is absolutely the main function. Now, I can tell you that uh, sometimes people on the whip team vote against, they vote against leadership, vote against the whip. That's not a, at least I haven't been under any other whips, okay, and, and they have different personalities. But under the whip we're under, I mean, that we serve on the team with, no pressure from him. He just didn't want to be surprised. And, and, and also, if you tell him you're going to whip, like if I ask Roby, and I say, Roby, how are you going to vote on this? How are you thinking you'll vote on the transportation bill? He goes, you know, I, I think I'm a yes. I've looked at it, and I think I'm a yes. And then he votes no on the floor, well, they want to know that ahead of time because they've got to recalculate their numbers. Because it's democracy on the floor, just like in running for office, is about votes. And you've got to be able to count how many votes you got to know whether you're going to succeed or not. So that's what the whole whip operation is about. Now, I'm not the whip, but the way the whip uses that would be, let's say this is the speaker and the majority leader, and they're sitting around, the speaker may look to the whip and go, so how's it looking on the transportation bill? And the whip will say, well, uh, the last whip count, we had 218 yes and whatever no. Okay? And he'll say, well, man, that's close. Or how many lean yeses? Well, we've got, you know. So that, that's what it's all about. Uh, now, again, it can be different depending on the personality of the whip. Uh, but that is generally the way it works with, with us. Now, it, in terms of my constituents, look, if I don't agree with leadership on something, I'll vote against them. I mean, they just want you to tell them. They just don't want to be surprised. Uh, the, one of the high-profile deals where I voted against the speaker was to kill the 
alternate engine to the F-35, which I think was in the speaker's district. More than anything, they just want you to, you know, they just want to know so, so that you're ac they're accurate in their count where you're going to go. Let's go back to your follow-up question yep. up here. That's right. Not a med he has not proposed a Medicare reform. Well, I'm glad you raised the IPAB. The IPAB is a disaster. Here's why. What they, they did not do, they did not reform Medicare as it operates. What they did was they said, we're going to set up a panel, and you can talk to doctors about the IPAP. Most of them love to talk about the IPAP. The Independent Payment Advisory Board, it's a, it's a, a, a board of un, unelected appointees who, uh, when Medicare runs out of money, okay, uh, they will then decide where the cuts come. That's not reforming Medicare. That's cutting uh, or recommending tax increases. What I tell people is cuts will not save Medicare. Cuts alone will, you have to reform the way Medicare works. Uh, and he has not reformed the way Medicare works. If you look at the editorial in Washington Post and lots of different publications, uh, the reviews of the recent budget that the president proposed, it is, it, across the spectrum, it is widely recognized that he just punted on those issues. Now, the, the problem with the IPAB, is, as I said, it doesn't fundamentally change in anything, it just cuts. You can have a, uh, a 75 Pinto, and you can paint it, you can put good gas in it, you can put new tires on it, it's still going to be a 75 Pinto. This is an analogy, a metaphor, but... The point is this, to change it, to make it compete and work differently, you have to completely change it and reform it uh, to where it works better and more efficiently. Um, and that, you can't, just, you can't just put a new paint job on it. And that is, that is ultimately the problem. Uh, it, we have to make some reforms to Medicare and some of these other programs. And again, I don't claim to have all the answers on the reforms. I want to debate on the reforms. But right now, we've got some reform proposals. I know there's the new bipartisan Wyden uh, um, Ryan proposal uh, with Democrat Wyden of the Senate and Ryan of the, uh, of the House. Let's debate reforms. Let's have an open debate. I love to debate. Let's debate Lieberman's ideas. Let's debate them all. But what we've got to agree on is the status quo is not, is not an answer. That is not an answer. Because the status quo is going off a cliff. You don't have to believe me. Believe the president's own bipartisan debt commission. Look at your Simpson-Bowles report and what they recommended. What they said is... Yes, we need to trim in a lot of different places, but you've got to deal with the drivers of the debt. And what I tell people is cutting Medicare line by line will not fix it. Cutting is not the answer. It has to be reform. If you take the same exact status quo system and all you do is like the IPAB, cut, cut, cut to make it meet the budget, you're going to devastate Medicare and it's not going to be any better. It's just going to have less money. You've got to actually change it to save it. And uh, so I welcome all sorts of reform ideas, and I, and I hope some people put forth some more, one, some more plans. There's several out there now, but the president doesn't have one. And let me ask you this. Does anybody know, and, uh, and if you'd look this up, confirm, I think, it's, I think I'm accurate on this. The president's budget last year, president's budget last year, Democrat-controlled U.S. Senate, how many votes did it get? Zero. 
Zero. Not one Democrat senator voted for the president's budget. And you know what? They're saying this year they're not even going to bring it up because it's embarrassing. Well, Mitch McConnell, Republican, said, I'll bring it up. I'll let you vote on it. So I want to debate reform. I believe my, the ideas I advocate for will stand. Uh, and I love debating reform. I do not claim to have all the good ideas. But what I do know is there's a cliff ahead. I don't know which answer to get away from the cliff. I'm happy to debate it. I've got my own ideas. But I know there's a cliff ahead. And there's no debating that. And, and that's, I, that is one of the, the scariest deals. Not just because of what it's going to do with regard to Medicare and Medicare recipients who count on it. That's a huge problem. But also, if you look at the broader context, it's, uh, we've got to deal with that or we're not going to fix the debt. And again, you don't have to believe me, Simpson Bowles. Simpson Bowles, Simpson Bowles, Simpson Bowles. President's Bipartisan Debt Commission. I don't agree with everything in it, but there's a lot of good stuff in there. And in fact, I, am reach, I have reached out to Simpson and Bowles, and I'm trying to work to find things that we can, um, that we can agree on, Republicans and Democrats, uh, because this is a big, big problem. Sorry. I know you're put, she's tapping her watch. Yeah. Let me do this. I'm going to give you my cell phone. I'm sorry. Maybe I didn't mean to did. cut you off. Yeah. My cell phone, 501-837-5190. Uh, uh, no prank calls, please. Uh, you can text me. You can call me. I routinely give it out to hundreds of people. And, you know, people, uh, when they feel the spirit move them, uh, text me or, or call me or whatever. Leave me a message. If I don't answer, I will get back to you. I promise. Um, Dr. Barry uh, knows I returned calls. I returned his last week. Uh, and so, I'll shut up now. You're good. All right. Well, thank you for being with us, and thank you all for coming. And, Jay, I'll hand it back over to you. All right. Thank you.